John Mayer is a seven-time Grammy winner, a multi-platinum selling artist, and a prodigious guitarist who's played with everyone from Eric Clapton to Ed Sheeran. But in recent years, you might know him better for making headlines than for making music. From tabloid-ready falls in and out of love with famous women to a notorious tell-all Playboy interview. Then he disappeared from the spotlight, avoiding social media and interviews and building a quieter life in Montana. I caught up with him in L.A. as he works on a new, deeply personal album and tries to put the focus back on his very first love. When I discovered the guitar when I was 13, all of the creative energy went into that. So I was sitting in class writing lyrics. I was in math class on one of those uneven desks where you, you know, you know, writing lyrics. One story that's out there is that Back to the Future was the genesis of the guitar idea. That was the big rocky moment for a lot of kids who were into music. And that for me was like the, the moment the nerd gets revenge, right? Like, who is this nerdy Marty McFly kid? And then he gets to play basically... Blowing people's minds. Yeah, blowing people's minds. <laughs> Which is a child fantasy, being the quiet kid in the room all of a sudden plugs in and plays. You know? Were you an outsider? That's a good popular? question. I had created this alter ego, which was by day, this sort of mild-mannered kid who nobody really saw. And then by night, I would be in a room listening to Charlie Parker and John Coltrane and Freddie King and, and Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and I was playing along with CDs and then I went to school and it was very difficult. But then you ultimately got to do that. You pursued that as an adult. It happened really fast for me, really, really fast. By 2000, I signed my record deal. 2001 record came out. Room for Squares. Yeah, yeah. Bodies of Wonderland is everywhere. Yeah. Uh, radio loves you. Run away. You're transformed. Yeah. What's that experience like? It's just a rocket ride. Were you ready for it? Yeah. I was ready for it. Everything that happened was, it made perfect sense to a guy like me. If you'd asked somebody from Fairfield, Connecticut, what do you think is going to happen to John? So you go, oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He was going to hit it so hard that at first people were going to go, great job and he was never gonna stop until he went off the rails. I think you went off the rails, though? You used that uh, term? In, in my way, based on, based on what my payload was, I didn't have a drinking problem. I wasn't, um, it was a thinking man's, it was a thinking man's fiasco, right? It was like, and it's a lot harder to explain to somebody. When you're 23 and you begin your life at the top of the chart, and you've got that spunk and you go bring on the world and you go, okay, here's a Grammy and here's an audience and you got it. Now, when you invariably do find out that not everything you touch turns to gold, you've got a choice. You either bleed out or you tie off, right? So what's the point at which you tied off? I tied off after I went, all right, dude, uh, you, did, you did a couple of interviews where, where you were out of touch and you were b b being a ham and you were basically breakdancing into a nit nitroglycerin plant, right? <laughs> now you don't even have the chance that everybody's gonna love you ever again. They, they handed me the Playboy interview before it came out and I knew, I, I knew that, I knew. You could have sat down in front of me and said, John, that's not getting printed, but I wanted you to know what would have happened had I not stopped that interview. But do you think they shouldn't have printed that? No, I do think they should have printed it. You just think there's a place for that moment of mercy? Well, you give it to yourself. You give it to yourself, you know. You gotta give it to yourself. But, you know, um, in that period of time, I would have rather killed myself than been killed. I was never gonna wrap my Corvette around a tree. I was, my, my high-speed crash was an intellectual one. What was the moment where you first thought, okay, this is not what I wanna be known for? Oh, man. The first time somebody misunderstands you and says you're a womanizer. You don't consider yourself a womanizer? No, no, absolutely not. But when you're crafty and you're clever and you go, well, I'm just going to be as strange as they think I am. So, okay, now you're on TMZ and you're playing into the role. You're leaning into the role, right? And, you, and then you lose, number one, you're not playing music anymore. Number two, you're not feeling anything honestly. And number three, you're not saying anything honestly. You once said you abused the ability to express yourself. Oh yeah. What's different now? Oh, uh, I know what I want. I don't care if this video gets 500,000 views or 50,000 views or 5,000 views. I'm not out 
to affect that anymore. That's for me to care about. That's for you to care about, man. Are you susceptible yourself to wanting the Twitter feedback? Yeah. Wanting the approval? Yeah, that's why I pull myself off of it again. I'm a recovered ego addict, and the only way that I can, that I can be sure that I don't relapse is to admit that I constantly have this ego addiction every day. So I do the Grammys and I go home, because if I stayed, I'd get high again. And then, and then I'd get high and then I'd get low. High on the approval. Yeah, well, yeah. You've already looked through Twitter, everybody goes, it's great. And then you're low again because you can't stop looking or you get, you get low because you read the one negative thing. So I'm a recovered ego addict. Like this is not the first outfit I put on today. I'm admitting that because that's my AA for being an egomaniac. Are you gonna check Twitter after this interview? I will not check Twitter, but I checked the mirror, the original Twitter. The mirror, I checked my mentions in the glass. How has this changed since you broke? There's new technology now. Yeah. There's instant feedback now. Right. The technology that I think I'm, I'm confident enough to say is hurting music is that musicians are, are very self-conscious now. They're very self-aware. I see people sing and I go, they're hoping they do okay. And they're gonna find out if they do okay. They're looking for the feedback. They're singing whilst judging. They're performing for the Twitter mentions. They're just hoping that, that when they get in the car on the way to dinner, they're gonna, their face is lit up and they're checking to see if they did okay. I could go on a sermon if I wanted to, but I just don't know how old fart it would sound. I just don't wanna call BS on things that aren't for me. You, you have two choices. You can look at Sam Smith and you can say, you can be all cynical and go, well, I knew Sam Smith when it was that. You go, yeah, but they don't. Are Mind you them. implying that Sam Smith is trainer wheels for people who haven't heard no, that kind of no, song? No, I don't. I mean, it, but, it, but if you wanted to be cynical, you could listen to it and go, oh, I've heard that when it was X, Y, and Z or something. And I'm kind of picking the guy out of a hat because I, I like Sam Smith. And I would use Sam Smith as, as an example for so many great things. I go, Oh, well, that, they're doing that again. Like, that's been done. But you go, wait, don't hold your age against other people. You know what I mean? Because it's the first time they've ever gone, da 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 ba da 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 And they go, wow, I've never heard someone sing like that. You go, have it. I want you to have it. You think it's getting worse to Yeah, because yourself. there's nobody to tell you what to do anymore. Artists overthrew the record company heads, and the record company heads cannot tell an artist when to put a single up on their own, you know, on their, you know, they put a clip on of your song on Instagram, yeah. SoundCloud. And they can and, say whatever they want. And they can say whatever they, they want, want anytime they want. There's no checks and balances. So and how's technology changing that? When you look at, say, Taylor Swift coming out and saying, and I'm talking about Taylor Swift professionally. You ha here. We have to be able to talk <laughs> about Taylor Swift professionally. <laughs> yeah. We have to be able to, to so, talk about so Taylor So tell Swift. me about that. When she comes out and says, I'm not putting it on Spotify. Right. That doesn't respect the, the artists and the writers enough. I think that's cool. I think that's really cool. Uh, artists need the person with the loudest voice to speak for them and is she doing that I think so when you say that well, you can go to the Met Ball you know that's great it's a great way to use your voice is go I'm wearing Valentino or you can use your voice to give things well now some people the cynical could say you're helping yourself but it's trickle down you're not saying I want this just for me I think that's a really cool thing for a musician to do like there's only like like two percent of the music industry has 80 percent of all the media about it you know what I mean there's like four people and get all the press. Who get all the press. And if any of those four people say, I want to speak for the other people who just would never make this a story. The only reason that we're talking about Taylor Swift taking Spotify on is because she's Taylor Swift. And that's great. You said you could do that or you could go to the Met Gala. Yeah, yeah. Does, I'll, I'll go to the Met Gala. Still, <laughs> does, does it bother you when you look at her or anyone else we're talking about in this conversation and they're, they've got that side of their public persona no, too? No, not at all. Not at all. Nothing bothers me anymore, man. Do you still have that emotional reaction, though? Yeah. A Taylor okay. Swift, one of those four people. Uh, I check myself with it, but yeah. Yeah. I have a feel. There are going to be times when I make music as, as popular or, or, or empirically, empirically valuable as that in terms of be, making pop music that, that won't make, sell as many copies. And I'm fine with that. You, you get to an age, you go, look, 
if I save a baby from a burning building and Kanye saves, saves a baby from a burning building, there's more Google News hits on Kanye. I'm fine with it. You and Kanye saving babies from buildings. Now, is together, a movie I this see. is what I'm trying to tell you is together we're unstoppable. <laughs> but uh, that's a great episode. That's a new ER right there. But it, all we're talking about is like um, being honest with yourself and what to ask for in this life. I put out a song called Paper Doll. The song never got listened to as a song. It became a news story because of the lyrics. But you must have known that that's what it was gonna become when you no, wrote no, it. I'm not in the business of, of telling people what the song's about. I, don't, I never said anything about it, but, and now I just go, look, I can say the name Taylor Swift. She's an artist, I'm an artist. Let's just, everybody stop. Nobody's got a, a incurable cancer. We're rich people who get to live out our dreams. Let's just stop it. I'm a musician who's bigger than one song or one record. So it's really more about the longevity of all the work that goes together. And I'm just not interested in the things that won't last forever. What have you found in Montana? I just found home, man. And it gives you outside perspective. I'm gonna have one wife, a certain number of children, friends that are set, uh, fans that will, that will listen to the music that I make, and the greatest moment for me was giving up the big fight. The big fight to be this thing that gets off the airplane at LAX and floats through. And I have a lot, I have a lot of uh, admiration and like envy sometimes for people that large. You know, I'll be standing by the front desk sometimes being like, you know. Anyone want to notice me? Anybody want to notice me? You know? <laughs> but in the idea Is there of a party that still wants to be One Direction? Oh, that's such a good question, sure. But it wants to be One Direction via Neil Young. If you could say one thing to young John Mayer, say, right before Room for Squares, what's that message? I'd just give him a hug, I guess. Now, there's nothing you could tell that kid. There's nothing you could tell that kid. I'd give him a hug and then I'd go, this guy. <laughs> I'd say, that guy's really, really talented, but I don't want to be anywhere near him when that thing goes off. You know what, this is what I would tell my young self. You are now my young self. What a handsome young me you are. <laughs> I'm trying. There was never a shot. There was never a shot of doing this perfectly. It was never in the cards. That's what I write people. I wrote, I, I don't want to bring her into the conversation, but I wrote this uh, new up and coming Australian rapper. I don't want to give her name away because there's so many of them. So I, she's <laughs> hit. And I, I no said, who you're talking this about. is it. I said, don't be upset that you're feeling like you're just an inch away from having your cake here. This is the new way it's going to be. You're never going to do it seamlessly. Success comes with hatred now. Yeah, it just comes with, yeah, that's how we learn about things now. And I write, hey, I'm John. I just wanna let you know that this feeling you're having that uh, you become successful but the world won't stop hating on you, this is not a broken version of success. This is the new version of success. So we're doing this series on genius, and I promised you I would not put you in the position of describing yourself as a genius. I think I've genius. proven through this interview I am not a genius. There's this other side you get to, and you don't get there very often. I call it this other side, where while you're writing, you speak so much of your truth that you're even learning from it. John Mayer, it's like, uh, it's like a therapy session every time I talk to you. <laughs> Thank you, man. Well, for who is that? And now it's America's therapy session. Now it's America's. That'll be $325. <laughs> Insurance doesn't cover it.